All right, so you guys should all see this. So real quick, a note to this. If you're going to download this today with your, with your MacBooks, that logo at the bottom left, which would be uh, the left side of there, that is the older software. So if you guys download this today and you see the older version, you're on the outdated version or 1.5 and below. On the right-hand side, 1.5 and above, up to 2.2 right now, that is the newer version. So uh, logos are very, very important here because it tells you the difference between what's current and what's out outdated. So just a quick visual for that for anybody who's going to download it today and, and follow along. Um, most people are used to seeing, when they're doing this, you're used to seeing this, right? And this is very kind of complicated, but not too much, right? I see over here I have my time code for my total runtime versus how much time is left. I have my videos, videos here. I have an audio file down here. I have an image of what's playing out on the program side. And then I have a thumbnail of what's going on and some verbiage I can do here. Uh, and this kind of looks really complicated, but if we broke this down to a much more simpler way of looking at it, which would be this example here, uh, is very just four different uh, key areas to look at. And the first one being on the left-hand side is that play set, playlist and transport area. And what that is, and again, I'll go back here real quick, what that is is just where all my video cues are positioned, right? On that left-hand side here. All this is is a playlist. And what that means is I can bring in my content here. I can check it real quick with a visual of the thumbnail to make sure that this is the right one. I have a verbiage information here. I have a start time, a total runtime, and then some functions down here that we'll get into in just a second. And then if I have audio playing, I have an example of a VU media here. They're not true, they're digital, so they're not exact, but they are visually appealing to you so that you have an understanding of where you spell at at some extent. And we'll get into that a little bit on the hands-on side of this. And at the bottom here, you have a waveform monitor so you can see where the clipping is, where it's going at. And we can see from this one already where the green is right now, where that time that player is. I can see that right after this little area that there's some clipping going on. So I may want to instinctively lower that if I haven't done so already on the other end. So again, I'll go forward here. The middle side is what they call the playhead area or the program window. And all this shows you is a, is a visual repetition of what is playing out on your output side. And there's multiple ways of what you can play out too, but on the programming side, this is your visualization here. And then on the right-hand side, you have a preview side of what's, uh, what is either current or coming up next uh, of what you've clicked on from the thumbnail side, again, from the playlist. So it's a little back and forth, but there's a reason for that. And once we get into the hands-on, you'll kind of see that a little bit more. And the bottom here is just a down and dirty uh, waveform monitor with a timeline for you so you can go through things back and forth. Uh, and when you look at it this way, it's a little bit easier to understand this concept. Uh, and again, if I overlay the two images together, we would see this. So playlist and transport, playhead, waveform, and preview. And preview is a little misleading there, but the verbiage, again, is not used by anybody else. So it's better to use this than, than nothing. But the preview side allows me to get into some of these advanced functions. And when we get to the hands-on portion, we'll dive into that some more. Right now, we'll just dive into a little bit on the playlist and transport side or that left-hand side. So if I keep going forward here, when you first start opening these up, you should see at least one video or you're going to see nothing and you want to upload a video. And again, when we get to the hands-on, I'll show you how to do that. It's a very quick button click. I will also provide you guys, if you, at the end of this uh, deck here, you'll see some... Um, you'll see some... Uh, hotkeys you can use, but for this presentation, since we're virtual, I'll try to be as key active as possible on the screen side so you can see what I'm clicking on or how I'm dragging this in without using hotkeys. I'll try to use the mouse as much as possible. Uh, again, you guys have a microphone out there if you want to stop me and ask questions, or if I've gone too fast on something, let me know and I'll, I'll go back and show you how you can get that done. But essentially, the first thing you want to look at is these functions right here, which are the most important and the ones you'll get to the most. These are your, your kind of your hotkeys, your actionable keys. So this first symbol here is called replace Q source. And what this does is if I have a video here and let's say I have an updated version of this video, let's say a version two or version four or whatever the case might be, I can click on this and replace this one file in here. And it's really important for what this does because it keeps it in line to the timeline where above that you can see where that one is. That means this is ID one essentially. And if I just updated this, instead of having to replace this, drag a new file in and drag it to the top, I can literally just replace the one I have from my folder and now update it very, very quickly. So this is a cool function to have, very, very quick and easy to use. The next one is audio toggle. This is to turn the audio on or off. Uh, and this is a really good thing to use on a lot of scenarios where maybe the audio that I have in here isn't what I need, and I just need the visual for, let's say, a background cue or a brought in something last minute. So you can turn that on or off. And again, you can see it down here at the bottom. And if you haven't realized already, if it is blue or highlighted blue, that means it's activated. If it's in gray, it means it's not activated at all. The next one we have here is beginning, uh, pause at the beginning. And what that means there is that when I initially click on this video, it will be stopped or it won't just play through. So there's two ways that MIDI does this. And this is where a tra uh, trap I would say people fall into is that they'll upload this without knowing about these things and they'll go to click on this or to activate that 
section, right? To get ready for the next queue. So my, my client might say, hey, hey, stand by for main title. I may click on this to stand by on it. And because I don't have this activated, it will now just play through actively, uh, which is not what we wanted at all. And if the audio engineer is relying on you to do your job properly and he has your mic open on his end, now you've just played an audio file with video that isn't being shown anywhere, which can be distracting. So this is a very good key to put, put this on at the beginning so that you can activate this thumbnail, go to the general side and type into there without having to play anything out. And the next one we have is fade in ability. So depending on how the video got edited, you could have a fade in already built in. And at that point, you don't want to turn this on at all. Or you could do a fade in after the fact. So maybe it, it pops in real quick with something, but it's not very interesting. And they want it to fade in so that they have a second to go from iMac to video source or PowerPoint to video source. And they want this quick fade of transition uh, to be built into this. Now, a uh, word of advice here, though, this does not add fade in ability. This is on top of the existing video. So you're not adding more time to your video. Whatever your zero zero point is, it'll be a three second fade in from black to video. So a very good uh, point to make about that is that you don't not adding an essential fade in ability. You are adding it to the existing video time, but not adding more time to it. Essentially, the next one is uh, key to a lot of things, and we'll dive into this a little bit because there's two ways to do this necessarily. Or there's two ways to do this that would be beneficial to you guys. There is a queue loop, and on the general side, on the hands on portion, we'll dive into this. But there's a queue loop of how many times this video will play through itself. So again, I have to have it blue activated and on the general side or the other side of the screen where it says preview. What I want to do there is I want to tell it how many times I want this video to loop before it just stops. There's another way to do queuing, which we'll get to in a second, or a little bit down this here. We'll get to about how I can link multiple videos together and then play those videos in a certain amount of time frame. Okay. And then the next one we have here is transition to next queue toggle. Uh, so this enables or disables it, and what this allows you to do is set up a, a sequence of when this video ends, it goes to the next video. When that video again, it goes to the next video. And you can change. It doesn't have to be in order either. It could be one, three, four, eight, whatever you want, as long as when this is activated and at the end here, which you'll see during the hands-on portion of it, as long as that happens, you have the ability to change that out on the fly or let it play in a sequence app. And then finally here, you have the fade-out ability. Now, technically, a lot of times, it's really good to add to the end of a video, uh, the fade out ability, if it's not going to a logo, just gives it a clean ind indication of what's going on. And you'll see this when we do the hands on portion here. When you go from zero, one to zero, there is still a bunch of milliseconds or 60 milliseconds of time code that needs to run out. That is the difference between cutting too early and cutting too late. And having a fade out ability gives a visual cue, not only uh, as an auditory cue for what you're doing, but also a video cue for the, audit, for the team to essentially switch from, again, your video source to PowerPoint or to iMac or to whatever the next sequence of events is. Uh, so sometimes it's really good to add, but again, you have the ability to either add it uh, to a video that doesn't have it. If it goes to logo, sometimes you want to add that in there if other videos are doing that. If it goes to logo and the client says, hey, I want to stand this for a couple of seconds, then you definitely don't want to add that. But again, you have the ability and the control to change that on the fly based on what your needs are for that particular show. And then another key one to put here, which is another fail that I feel people trap or trap themselves into is pause at the end. So imagine if pause at the beginning and pause at the end weren't activated, but what happened is, is my video would just play through. So if I didn't have this activated, which it is on now, it is on for, for this example. If it was off, however, that means at the end of that video, it would go to the next queue and play that video through which would definitely not be what I wanted to do unless it was part of a looping for the beginning for let's say opening doors. I want to have a couple of videos looping a couple of times. I would want to have that off. If I'm in show mode though, I would definitely want to have this on for each one of my clips so that at the end of the clip it stops there, it doesn't go any further. Uh, also some of the animations you might get or some of the videos you might get have a logo at the end. If that is the case, then that logo you want to definitely stop there uh, so the audience can see that for a couple of seconds. And then going forward here, we have go to. So go to is a very individual functionality. And what that means is that at the end of this clip, assuming I don't have pause at the end on, it'll go to either the next clip or a clip that I've told it to go to by identifying the ID of that. And again, the idea of that will be on the preview side in general, which we'll dive into more on the hands-on portion of that. Um, but these are your basic fast functions here. Uh, the only thing we haven't gone over here, which uh, I didn't create a side for, so I apologize for that. But if you look at the top left-hand corner here, you're going to see this little clip icon or a, a slate board. That slate board tells me that this is a video that they're using. Uh, if, you, if you upload a video, an image, a PowerPoint, a uh, side phone, NDI, those icons will change to match what that is. So it's another visual cue for you to know what my files are very, very quickly. And again, if I've already had these preset up a certain way, or if in settings I've, I've set up my settings to be a certain certain way for my default of how I want to run the system essentially, then I can have these lowered or, or closed out essentially, which will show the, how that works here in a minute, uh, but how that closed out, and I don't have to look at the preview at all, 
or these active buttons. I just get my titles. Uh, and then another note you can make too is you can leave the title as one thing. And again, we'll get into this in a second. Leave the title as one thing and add a memo. So maybe the client's calling this XYZ, but he wants the cues to go off of the screen switcher operator who's got uh, look one, look two, look three. And let's say you're look four, for example. And anytime he calls look four, he wants video XYZ to play. You can put that in your notes section so that you're ready for that as well instead of just having to write it down on pen and paper. So that kind of goes over the basics, quick, down and dirty fundamentals of MIDI and some traps you want to look out for when you're running this program. So if you guys have a laptop in front of you, I recommend going to immunot.com slash MIDI. Uh, if you go to Immunot page, they also have another program, which is called Visor. And this is a way to do MIDI and kind of a vMix setting here. And if you guys go to that page here, which again, I know you guys can because I can see you, uh, you would just click on here. It's a free download. You get it for a certain amount of time period. I want to say it's 60 minutes at a time. Uh, it's full access, whatever you need to do. What's really cool also about MIDI for the production side, for corporate, corporate, for example, is that MIDI allows you to have two keys. So if you want to be a MIDI playback operator and provide this as a service, you could buy MIDI with one key for about 400 bucks, and you get two keys and put this on as a primary and a backup on either machine that you had. All right, so next, when you open up, you will see this window here. And as you can see, I have a file loaded for you guys to kind of follow through with me on. Uh, you would just click on new project for yourself after you downloaded it, uploaded the content, and opened it for the first time. You would see this. It would actually register. You would say try as demo uh, and just click on new project and it would open it up. So this is the end of the presentation I have for you. Like I said, very quick and easy, not very complicated. Go to me full screen. Before I dive into the actual programming side, does anybody have any questions about what you just saw or anything I've said so far? I'll take that as a no. I see someone saying no. I see one guy talking to somebody else here. I see somebody getting, going away from this. <laughs> Just kidding. So okay. I will go ahead and dive into the programming side here. I'm going to go in and go to this next computer here, and I'm going to share that screen with you guys in just a moment. So this is MIDI, and this one I've already loaded, and I've gotten up set up here. So this is MIDI on the general census, and I'm sure everybody can see this. If you can't, raise your hand, and I'll, I'll work on it with the team here. But you should be able to see what I have going on here. And again, I've just added a couple of things. So here's a tank face. Uh, stair screens. Here's a Dante 1K tone that I created for certain scenarios. FaceTime video. So if I use this one, I double click on it. You can see the camera that I have down here. Also, if we go to our web page. You can see this here. Uh, and then uh, AVE intro. And then we we'll go to the thank you video at the end here. But again, you can see I've already done some pre stuff here. And this everything looks the same to you here. The only difference right now you're seeing is this ability to go to two here. And I'll stay right here real quick because we have Tank Facet. And we'll see over here. I got to move this out of my way. I'm going to close this up real quick. So we have on the preview side, general, subtitles, closed captioning, geometry, color controls, and transition and fade out. And this is where there's a couple of things you can do here. So what you can't see right now is above this section here where my arrow is, there's what's called files. And in files, you have the ability for a new project, open, or open a recent project, similar to what you just had on the other side when you first created this page. And then here's where you can either with hotkeys, command one, two, three, four, five, or command shift one, two. Uh, you can add videos, stills, audio cues, a camera cue, a siphon cue if you have siphon. Uh, real quick, if you guys understand the difference between siphon and NDI, for example, siphon is internal to the computer. So this allows systems to talk to each other internally, where NDI also does that. But in addition to doing it internally, it allows you to do it over IP, for example. Uh, so you can bring in an NDI feed or bring in a siphon feed uh, so you can have things to talk and play to each other. And you can add a browser cue as well, which we added here already. Uh, and then you can add, add a Windows source queue. So essentially, like in OBS, for example, or in vMix, I could add my screen directly to this and share that screen out if I had to for any situation. Or I could do this by the network side. Um, and that's how you do that. Save, save as. These functionalities across the board are universal. And then bundle playlists, which we won't get into. But essentially, this is creating a, a new save format that allows me to play all these, all these in, a, in, a, in a sequence of events. So that's where our file comes into place. Then we have the edit side. So undo change loop counts. Uh, so you can see right now I only have, I believe, one of these loop counts on. So right now it's set to three, so this would play three times before it just stops. But you can also see that I don't have the place pause at the end. So this would play three times and then continue to play until I had this actually activated. And then the third time it would stop. I come back up here. So that's a real quick hot way to change that out. If I were to do cut, it would uh, delete this section or I can copy it and do another one. Uh, I could paste in a source if I had to do that. I could paste the match styles. Uh, when you say match style specifically, what that is doing is that if this this one, for example, had specific settings, so I'm going to hotkey command copy right now, and you can see the ability to come up for paces there. I haven't changed much on that except for the looping, uh, but the looping has two functionalities, which again, we'll dive into in a second. 
And then I can duplicate this file. I can select all my files, uh, start to teach an emoji, uh, emoji and symbols. Uh, I don't have any usage for it, to be honest, so I don't know what they do. Uh, then at the top here, I have view. So hide view playlist and transport. So I click on that. I lose a portion of my screen. Not ideal. Um, so I'm going to bring that back. If you are using this with a MIDI emulator, which we could talk about in a minute, there are also hotkeys down here, and I can eliminate portions of my screen so that I only see what I need to see down here as well, other than just the hotkeys. All right? And this, this can actually be in handy, too, when you're, on, when you're doing an emulator and you want to see just playlist, and you're outputting this to a uh, HyperDeck emulator, for example, or to an output that you don't need to see exactly what's being previewed out because you can see it in front of you. Uh, so again, I'll go back to the View tab here. I can hide queue preferences, hide waveform monitor at the bottom there, collapse or expand queues, disable auto scroll queues. And again, these are queues here, but I can also do that from here. I can just click on this uh, down arrow here and just see it like this. And again, if, if I'm confident and my, my settings have been set already, this is an easy way to run it. Uh, personally, for me, I like to always see what's going on so that if I do any changes or any modifications, I always have a visual of at least of what I need to see at, and I can give some kind of indication if I get called on comms about what the next queue is by either name or by notes. Uh, and again, I'll go back to the view side here, set queue types, hide queue time for overlay preview. Again, all these abilities are just uh, in the menu side, and I just showed you a couple ways to do that here. Hide rendering frames per second, which goes down to down here, this 60 frames per second. Uh, this is just a good reference to show you. I also have my time code up here as well, as I can see. And I uh, display remaining queue time, which would be up here as well, one, these two as well, and then disable queue end times. Uh, I wouldn't do those. <clears throat> I wouldn't want to see that stuff. It's very, very important for when you're doing the shows and having to have a, count a countdown timer that is reliable to what you're doing. The next type I have is a queue tab. So rewrite current queue, go to 10, go to 20, go to 30. Again, most of these queue options are right up here as well. I got to move this tab. Yeah, most of these are right here. So this would be to go full screen or hit command F. This would be my total time for that track. So I go ahead and click on here and I take this through. I can see it running here, matches to this over here. And I can see how much time is left. And also, this has no audio, which I can tell because the waveform is empty, but I can also see the timeline coming here. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and stop this. Oops. Oh, because I have the loop on, so we're going to go pause. And we're just going to cue the next one. So let that stop. And I have some abilities here, which I saw as well, which is fast forward, jump to next, jump to previous rewind, fast forward, and then the ability to either loop continuously or loop the one video here. So real quick, we'll go back to cues. Again, all the same functionalities are there as what I had on the top window there. And we have playlists here. So a couple of things to note about the playlist is very important here. A standalone mode is MIDI on its own taking the internal clock of the computer and running it that way. So if you're in a different time zone, uh, let's say you're uh, in the East Coast and you go do a show on the West Coast and you bring your machines with you, and you haven't updated the time zones to that coast, your timeline, uh, your timing would be different than what's on that coast timing-wise. So if you need something to be on a world clock, for example, this wouldn't work. MTC follow mode and LTC follow mode are simply standards, or LTC follow mode is standard. MTC is a, a different uh, follow mode that you can use. However, if you turn these on, you disable some other abilities uh, that are also need a uh, time code of some sort. So typically standalone mode is best. If, again, you're big, you want to come into that playback operator position and run your own system and have the ability to do, let's say, a data link or a um, Madwell card to in, bring in or ingest a time code from Artnet or things like that, uh, changing this ability here would affect you versus doing it in a different section, which we'll get into in a second. Playlist preferences here. Again, you can see it on the side. And then the same functions that I have here on this side are pretty much here as well. We're getting the panic and just at the end of this. Panic mode is a very, very, uh, it's a command function. So command escape is what I have a program does now. And there's ways to change what panic mode does. And this, again, is for those scenarios where something goes wrong. You're going to command mode to go to a certain queue or to pause the video or to it does fade and pause, or just fade out and do nothing. Uh, this can be changed out. A lot of times I recommend you go to fade out and then uh, let the backup take over, essentially, or switch that out through the switcher side. Uh, select preview queue, select next queue. Again, we've gone to these persons here, which you do with the mouse. It's just by double clicking here or double clicking here. Jump to first queue, jump to last queue. This is the start or stop of a video, which is what the, they call jump. Jump to previous queue, jump to next queue, jump to selected queue. Again, it re refers to this side of the screen. And then another one we have here is uh, active video outputs. This is just see what's going on. And we'll dive into this in just a moment here. 
So you have set up video output and set up audio output. We'll go into this after we go into the settings side uh, because I do have some, some more stuff to show you on that. And then uh, Windows are just generic information about the setting you have here. You have a help section. If you go to Welcome to MIDI, this gives you a little introduction of who they are. You go to Documentations. This will take you online. So if you are online and you need help to read the manual, it will not take you anywhere. And then Contact Support. MIDI has a very good support team. They're very quick to respond, but they are in uh, Hungary. So they're in different time zone than most of us here in the U.S., so be conscious of that fact that you may not get a response until the middle of the night. Their time, morning, uh, your time, daytime, they'll be sleeping. So just be cautious when you do that, reach out here. And real quick, uh, what we didn't go over yet was uh, MIDI itself, the tab there. And what I want to go to is settings. Now, this portion here is kind of the deep dive of where you can get in here and really uh, fine tune things. So preferences, and the reason we're going over this portion first here is that preference is the settings or the master settings for the whole system. This tab over here in general, which we'll go over to in, in a moment as well, this will override what you've done here. So be very cautious of that, that whatever you do here, these are think of these as your settings for yourself to run how you want the machine to run, but you can override those individually on each individual file by clicking on the preview side here and overriding the functionalities there. So we'll go over these real quickly here. So playlist again refers to the playlist, which we know is this side here, and I have simply frame rate, which is 30 or 29. This would be based off a of standalone mode. If I change that to a different format, to the LTC mode, uh, this gets disabled here and we'll base it off of that. Uh, start timer offset is 000 across the board. Again, this is a simply format here of time code. Uh, this will always go this way unless you tell it otherwise. Uh, if you wanted to change this, for example, though, it would start all your video cues at XYZ seconds or minutes after the fact, universally for whatever I downloaded after this here, uh, versus it being 000. Fade duration, one second. So you can change that for one second to three second. And that would change this fade direct fade here and fade here. So typically I would put this at three seconds for myself. Oops, three seconds here, fade in, three second uh, fade duration. Uh, and that's where we change that. Transitions, you have dissolve functionality here. Oh, you can't see the setting menus on the screen. I understand. That is not good. <laughs> Let me see if we can uh, share this differently. So hold on. Let me go here. Here we go. Thanks for the heads up, Doug. So now you guys see what we're talking about here. This is the preference setting here. I'm, thanks, Doug, for letting me know. Uh, so when you have playlist here, you have system uh, system frame rate, which is based off of SIMTI, and time code based on SIMTI. Here's over to fade duration, transition duration. Now, this one is, is key here, dissolve, and then you have wipe abilities. So wipe right, wipe left, wipe up, down, and ripple. I would never use any of these, but again, you're, you're your own people out there. Do whatever you like. I would always have this dissolve. And again, I can super or override this in the general section or the preview side. Uh, playlist toggle, I can activate or deactivate these and as a whole for the whole system. I can either have them on or off completely so they're not accessible or disabled essentially. And then jump action behavior. So jump action behavior is when I click on something. Uh, and again, let's go back to what I said a little bit earlier about if I double click, what does it do? Does it trigger the clip or does it load the clip? And I always want to do a load the clip. If I were to do a trigger a clip, if I double clicked on this pre on a preview, for example, which we can't see from the playlist side, it would activate that cue to play automatically. So if you're having that issue where you're double clicking and it's playing out, it is because this functionality is on trigger and not load. Uh, so load is what my preferred is. So I can load it in there and then I will use the space bar to activate that or cue it out. And then you have the panic behavior. So again, command escape is the panic behavior or the, the dump mode. This is like the oh shit button for you. So you have fade out and pause, fade out and rewind or fade out and load next. Uh, I pretty much use fade out and pause, uh, I've or, or fade out and load next, depending on what my show is. I've never had to use fade out and rewind yet, but it's actually just as what they say, fade out and pause means that it'll fade and pause exactly where you hit the command escape button. And then the idea is that you would take your backup, and, which is playing hopefully a couple seconds behind you. You would do that to then continue playing through or switch over on that. Fade out and rewind, you would do to restart the video. This could be useful in rehearsals, but not as, as accurate. And then fade out and load to next means it would stop or it's fade out and it loads an SQ, uh, you would lose that file sitting there. Uh, this could be used more for installations if you had a time code running where you had a certain time frame things ran through and if something didn't load properly or XYZ, you could just have it so they went to the next video and just kept playing through. And then you have browser source default. So you guys can see on the playlist previously, I had done google.com. Uh, you could set this a set of default to be MIDI, so you could, that tells you that I changed it myself, and I'll show you how to do that in a moment. And then you have default values for new cues. So again, this is overriding or superseding anything you would do on the uh, general side of the preview side if you want to start it this way. And you can, again, activate or deactivate some of these toggle cues you have or the abilities you have on the preview side. 
You go to audio outputs here. So audio output is a, is a big issue with a lot of different people. Uh, this, is, this is literally one of the ways you can get to there, or you can do it from the menu side, which we'll get into that in a second. But you have disabled audio, which means no audio goes out anywhere. You have system default, which means the computer's default settings. So think about your speakers or think about a headphone jack, for example. And then you have uh, NDI and SDI. So SDI is primarily for Blackmagic, the HyperDeck emulator. Or if you're doing it to a Black, 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 Black Deck Link uh, card, that's when you want to use that. And then NDI obviously goes out to NDI feeds uh, or system default by itself. Typically, if you just leave all three of these on, it'll just go out at all times to every single one of those, and you can pick it up one way or another. Um, but system default would be either your speakers or a headphone jack. NDI and SDI would be either a, uh, an out, out card for a Magua card or Black Light Dink. Uh, and this also allows you to uh, activate the um, hybrid deck emulator. And then you have some other options here to be more direct. So Micro Pro speakers. I have a uh, program called Cinemaker Audio Devices. It would route to that. I have the NDI only audio option, and I have VV cables here as well, and then Zoom audio device as well. So I can route my stuff directly to Zoom call if I was uh, linking to a Zoom or siphoning this out to a Zoom, for example, or I could just do system default NDI, which will blast on all sources. This uh, system default, I will say, though, doing NDI and SDI, the caveat to that would be that you are eating up more CPU processing. So if you don't have a bunch of heavy, cave, uh, heavy 4K video content, you're probably okay. Most users are either 720 or 1080. Uh, so I'd be okay with this setting. But if you had more heavy, heavy duty content that's 4K, maybe they're 30 minute videos and it's bogging down your Mac Pro forever, you might want to change your audio settings to free up some of that CPU uh, abilities, or sorry, the GPU ability to give you more power to run your content. Uh, output channels, you usually get two, two to 16. If you set these to change these out, which I won't do right now, it will reset or reboot your machine in order to change the settings for that. And then you have the output routing abilities. I only have two here. If I had more than that, I would have more abilities here to change out uh, left and right, for example. Uh, master volume here particularly pertains to the master of everything. Um, whenever you change this, I'd highly recommend to use auto normalization. And what this means is that if my master volume is negative whatever, let's say it's negative this right now, and I hit enable, which I always have on, what that does is that every video that comes in, it tries to auto analyze it and make it the same level. So. Some of you might remember if you're playback operators and you go through all these videos individually for rehearsal or after rehearsal, you spend a couple minutes with the audio engineer to really fine tune these levels. This is a way to help you speed that process up and get you more to play by just uploading and downloading content. And then you have what's called extended mono files. So I always put on to stereo. You could have an off or two all. And what two stereo does specifically in MIDI is that it turns any mono file into a stereo file. So it'll automatically give you left and right channels. It'll be two models obviously, but it'll be in stereo format. Uh, so this is very good to have on uh, always. And then if you're doing a Zoom event or you're doing a uh, or pretty much a Zoom event or anything else virtual and you're going somewhere and there's an audio delay coming from you, you can do the audio delay on your side versus having the audio engineer do it. Uh, doing this though is a little bit tricky. It is by milliseconds. Uh, typically, I would let the audio guy do this in general. But if you can figure out where you land millisecond-wise, you could uh, modify that on your end versus having them do it on their end. But again, this is very, very tricky because it could be an issue somewhere else, not just from your side. Then you have mats and overlays. Again, this is an ability for primarily the HyperDeck to create a green screen ability so that you can do overlays uh, when you bring in the emulator to, uh, sorry, a HyperDeck emulator to bring in, let's say, lower thirds or keys like that. It'll send out this. You can do a, a chroma key on the Blackmagic side. Then you have subtitles and CC. Unfortunately, I can't show you more than what this shows you here, and we'll have another tab as well that won't be activated. I don't have a, C a cart or a cart or an SRC ability um, in my system at the moment. So I can't really try this active, but what this section does here is it tells you what the font color would be, a background color, which right now is transparent, and then font size and font family. This would be activated though on the general side, which we'll show you there where that is. If I had a cart or SRT, uh, this will look for that, that source and superimpose it onto your content if you have it available and you can turn them on and off per input or you can have it on the entire time. And then you have integration here. So integration, again, is for that trigger with ATEM. I highly recommend if you're going to do that to do a manual IP. It works a lot better than doing the USB way of doing this. Uh, that way you put your MIDI on, uh, ATEM switcher on a IP address. You put the controller on an IP address, and then you put this on an IP address that matches on a network, and this will all talk to each other, and it'll show up. And what's really, really cool about this is on the emulator side on ATEM, which I, I don't have it here to show you, on the ATEM side, it'll, this, your playlist will show up in your emulator, so you can just play it from there directly and give it cues. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have anything plugged in as it's trying to connect here, so none of these functions will show me too many options. But if I had a uh, on the sorry, if I had on if I had an ATEM on the programming side, I have some functionality here to 
activate a, a button here for load next queue, pause or rewind. Uh, so I can activate these directly and then I'd have the ability to change that here as well. Uh, you do need to turn on the emulator for it to talk to each other. So if I disable this here, uh, as you can see, it's not going anywhere. And then trigger by NDI, you can also enable NDI triggers. So if I'm running NDI, for example, and I want to run this through there, through their proprietary software side, I can enable that and it'll do it as well. Uh, so NMC is, is how you would do a master, sorry, is how you do a director and uh, actor. Try to get my verbiage right here. Director and actor is how you would do this. MC, NMC is a proprietary language that MIDI uses for its program, particularly for when they have MIDI and Beezer, which is their VJ software essentially that works with MIDI. Um, this is their program. If you want to do a primary backup, you would need to use this. Um, unfortunately, I don't, have, I don't have anything plugged into this. I don't have another MIDI for it to, to talk to or to enable it. What you would need to do is once you have another, both of these on the same network, is enable this as the output. This becomes the director and the other one becomes the actor. And what this does is this sends out a ping for that one to see it. And then in sources, you would see that and you would activate this. And then you would have a, a director and actor scenario where you have a primary backup that play off each other. This does not transfer data as far as video goes. You just load videos separately. What it does do is it gives commands so that if my playlists are the same exact thing, if I go to next, it goes to next. If I play, it plays. And then on that scenario, you might want to go to playlist and do a delay here so that all my backup system plays three seconds later on the delay versus my primary one. So instead of me having to do it here, this is a way to automate that. But you need to enable the, the director's machine. needs to be enabled in order to be discovered by the actor's side. And then you have the typical OSC and UDB controls. Uh, so you have an on-screen controller uh, software or any of the other scenarios. You can enable that here and find that. I don't have anything plugged in here, so nothing to show. But again, you can enable it here. MIDI controls, uh, MIDI controls you have as well is an ability to uh, uh, control this with something else. Uh, for example, I think you guys can still see me. I've been able to use my a APC. I've controlled it with this before. I've gotten this up and running before in the past with this, with Resolum, with VMix, a couple of different scenarios, uh, primarily for the auto controls here and the ability to just hot punch to something I want here. Uh, so these are really cheap, relatively 80 bucks at the time. Um, USB out. Work pretty, pretty well. Just program them. Uh, no big deal. Um, again, we'll keep going down the list here. So if you have a DMS controller, you can, uh, again, I don't have anything plugged in for this, but you would want to do it on the Wi-Fi side. Or sorry, you want to do it on the interface side. You can do Wi-Fi as well. But DMX controller or Artnet is primarily for a lighting system to be able to control yours. And you can control, uh, once you have it plugged in here, you can you can activate learn here. And they can press a Q here and it'll, it'll on the lighting controller, whether it's a hog, uh, or, uh, not all right, sorry, whether it's a hog, a grand MA, or an ETC lighting console, you can uh, they can learn or MIDI can learn what buttons they're going to press to activate these cues essentially, so that you can do it that way. Uh, again, so t there is time codeability here. If you are not in standalone mode, there are some drawbacks. We were talking about the CPU GPU side of that. Some of the other drawbacks as well is that if you were doing time code inputs, you would lose some of the ability to do an LCT source you would lose some of the abilities to override what's being sent in time code on the individual journal settings here, which we'll get into uh, after this section here. And then transcoding. So transcoding folder is if you can create, or if you, again, run the system on your own, you can essentially create your own folders that will automatically transcode whatever you jump into this. And there's another way to do that on the fly as well, which we'll show you. But essentially, I can create a folder so that everything is transferred to either haptic or ProRes automatically, um, or I can do this on the fly each time I open, a, uh, I, open the, I open the program. And then the last thing here is deinterlacing. I can have this ability on or off, and this is just a way to um, lessen or uh, reduce the bandwidth of something I'm trying to push up. And finally, we have miscellaneous. So beta updates, I usually don't ever have those on because I don't, I don't want to be the test guy for anything. Uh, mode open is standalone, but if again, if you are in an installation scenario or if you are in a scenario where you have time code abilities, you can set it to open up with that in here. And again, remember everything in preference is the the default or the back end of how this activates and turns on. Auto start playback on option, activate output on open. I would never enable that as well. Disable, confirm, quit, prevent display mirroring. That's enabled here. And then reset warnings. Reset warning is, is uh, useful, but if you have a crash, you will automatically, when it reopens, MIDI will automatically ask you to send a report, and it's up to you to send that report. So I'm going to go ahead and get out of this here. So my screen sharing is paused at the moment. Let me go ahead and stop here, and I will, again, give it a second here. Does anybody have any questions about what we just went over? I know we're ingesting a lot of information here. 
If we're still good, I'll keep going. Thumbs up. All right. I'm going to go back to sharing the MIDI side here, and let's dive into some of these other functionalities here. So we're back on the MIDI side here. Doug, again, just let me know if I'm missing anything. Uh, I, I believe everybody can see this here. So I'm going to click on the star screen here. And if I hit play here, sorry, I double clicked on it. If I hit play here, it'll play out this video clip. I hit space bar here is what I just did to stop that. And on the right-hand side here, you see these general information here. So general information, what's really important about this part is if my client says, hey, I want to see movie star screen, and he's calling this airplane. Let's just say he's calling airplane. I can modify that here, and it'll automatically change here. So it doesn't matter what the original name was. Or I could have left it there, and I could have made a note for myself. He calls it airplane. All right, I can make a note about that. And then here you can see that where ID is set on two. I believe that where it is. ID set on two re references this ID here. And I can change that color to any other color. So if I wanted to group these together for a certain reason. Maybe this is the mo red's morning session, yellow's afternoon session, green videos are evening session. I can do it that way if I wanted to, or I could do just organized loop videos versus non-loop videos. I highly recommend when you're doing loop videos, upload multiples of the same file. Uh, and we'll get into that in just a second, why that's kind of important here. Uh, then you have your in time, your out time, which again, I can modify when this starts, essentially, and when this ends, if I want it to be different than what I have. So think of that as a way to cut up your footage, uh, but you need to do it in simply time code. So it's hours, minutes, seconds, milliseconds. And then you have play count for looping. So obviously on this file, I don't have it activated right now, but if I did, it would play three times. And typically if it's on zero, it's playing infinite. If I activate this, it'll just keep playing and playing and playing over and over again. And then you have the go-to functionality like I have on the top one here for tank facets. If I were to go to, I can go to any one of my already existing cues. And once it ends, it'll jump to that video. And then again, I can make a sequence of that. So a good way to do some stuff would be to do, let's say, dragging this up top. It's not changes to three. I could click on all three of these. And sometimes what will happen is this one, I'm going to right click here. Oops, sorry. Highlight this again. I'm going to right click on this. And you can see my make stimulus loop is deactivated here. So I could make one loop here. It's deactivated because I already have one activated here. So it won't let me do that. But another way to do this would be to just do it manually, which gives you a little more control. Uh, I can do two. So this will just jump to two. And then this one could jump to three. And then three could jump to one. And now I've created a loop of these three videos that'll just jump from two to three to one, and one, uh, three back to one. And there's a loop infinitely until I say otherwise. So I'll, I'll take these off so they don't pause. And I'll make sure that I don't have any, see this has a count of three, so that wouldn't work out. Put that on infinite. And now these three sequences here will play until I tell it otherwise. And then I have a, again, remember I have those visual cues all the time. So here's an audio file. So this one has audio on it and I don't want to play that out. So if I click on this, it takes me there, right? Because that's my jump. I hit space bar to play it through and I see the audio playing there, but I don't want it to play out. So I'm going to disable this. And now there's an audio playing out. I still see the ability here and I still see information. It's a frame rate, the codec I have down here, the duration, the dimensions, the location where it is in my folder. And another thing I could do here is I could right click it again on the, with the mouse. I could right click and I go to transcode the ProRes and transcode the HAP. So if I'm in a scenario where this, this video is having problems, it's lagging, it's jittering, it's maybe not maybe just not do something properly, and I've maybe gone to handbrake and changed things out already, what I could do is I can just go to transcode the ProRes, and it'll help, it'll help make that video file essentially more, more specific to what MIDI wants. Not that it doesn't play it through, but it just it could help you in whatever scenario is going on. And that's part of that, back to what we said earlier, about being proficient and technical in what you're doing. So these are quick ways to do this. HAP takes a lot longer to do. It's a lot more uh, friendly codec for media servers. This is a really big important thing for like Touch Designer, for example. Um, but ProRes is just native. It's what Playback Pro likes. Uh, movie or QuickTime Player is obviously Mac specific, but it has been kind of discontinued at this point. So uh, ProRes is the preferred go-to for everything. Uh, and you guys can see, as I was talking about that, this has been looping through uh, already because I didn't stop it. So it's just going up through and through. I'm going to go ahead and hit this and take us back off to the next thing and let it load through. So again, we've gone over this general section here. I'll give a second here and look at you guys. If there's any no questions, I'll keep going through. So I'll get rid of general there. And then subtitles and post captions. Again, I showed you in the settings side where to do that. I don't have anything in here for this, so I can't activate it. But if I did, it'd be in this section here. I'm going to close it down. And then you have geometry. geometry. And this is just a way to resize things on the fly. So a couple of things to note. I have scale to fit, scale to fill, 
uh, stretch of scale, and then on scale. And essentially, these are quick, down and dirty. It does all the math for you. You don't have to think about anything. And then I have the option where it says origin, center or top left. So if anybody's ever done any, any work with graphics or editing or any kind of software like that, center is means center of the screen. So if I go here, I'm going to unlock these real quick just so you guys – actually, I'll keep these locked together. It'll change together. So this is center of the screen. So that's ideally where that is, and I can go – Scale to fit. Oh, oh sorry, because I'm modifying it here. Uh, if I go to up here, I'm going to go to reset all parameters. If I go to upper left-hand corner, this is referring to that zero, zero point in editing. Okay? So, again, I'll go this way, and it'll edit that direction. And this, again, refers to that zero, zero uh, region of a, of a graphic. So, I'm going to come back here, reset all parameters. I'm going to go back to center because that's typically what you want to do. And if I unclick this uh, lock here, I can scale horizontally or vertically. And then I have positioning. So let's say, for example, this doesn't happen as too much. Back in the day, you had an Image Pro, let's say, or, or a Screen Pro. And what these do is that they're scalers, they're built-in scalers, and they might have an issue with, the, with the, maybe the Screen Pro or the projector or something you're playing to directly has an issue. What I can do is I can move this by pixel. So this is percentage here, not pixel count for scaling, but your positioning is pixel count. So I can move this position X by X amount of pixels, or I can move position Y by X amount of pixels. And this could be the difference sometimes between being on point or being just slightly off. And this gets really, really critical with some clients in their content if they have a lot of content right at the edges. And then also I can rotate that here, which I can also do in the video output side if I wasn't to rotate an image. Maybe something that I have doesn't fit properly and I want to just rotate it on the fly. I have the ability to do it here. I'm going to come back here. I can do reset all parameters. And then you have cropping ability. So crop left, pretty simple. Just to note here real quick, if no one's realized, this means that this is transparent here, so it'll play through something. If you're uh, sitting on an alpha channel, for example, this will, be, uh, this will be in front of whatever that alpha channel will be. This will just be completely transparent. Not, so I'm going to go bring this back down. Crop from the bottom, same example. Crop from the top. And crop from the right. So that's pretty much all the abilities you get there. And if for whatever reason it's a little bit small, you can do a quick reset there. And then you have the abilities on the fly to reset all your parameters here. Scale, position, rotate, crop. So reset all parameters. Go ahead and close it out. You have color controls. So real quick, when it comes to color control, there's, there's a couple things I want to make a note of. So you have U here. You have saturation. You have vibrance. And there's a confusion sometimes on how people think about this. When it comes to hue, hue is all the primary colors in, in, on the scale. So essentially, if I go from zero to the right, I'm going to start. Well, let's you know what. Let's do it this way. I'm going to go to uh, my camera here. So you guys can see me now. I have this camera here and another camera down here, which is why I need the other camera. But if I go to hue, you see my colors change, right? And I'm at 14 right here. This is the first color on the spectrum. It's going to go all the way over to the end. I'm going to go through all the primary colors, and then I'm going to hit back to zero essentially. And you can see at like 160. 170, right? I'm kind of a red tint here. So if I go now this way, again, this is just a straight line, and I go the other way, that first hit I get, that first couple numbers, that first 10, is that red kind of purplish tint, and then purple. And then again, we'll go this way real quick. That first color I get is like this yellow greenish tint. If I go this way all the way to the end, I get back to that greenish yellowish tint here. So it's not I'm going from one spectrum to the other. It is the same spectrum. Zero is where you're starting from. All right, and then I can go up here and I can hit reset all parameters or reset hue, saturation, vibrance, reset brightness and contrast, or reset the opacity. Let's go over this real quick. So in saturation, right here, I look pretty decent, but if I wanted to add, let's say, some more pigmentation or more reds to my skin tones, I can amp this up a little bit. Now I've got a little bit of tan, right? Like maybe I've been to the beach too much. Um, and you can see my shirt still has a nice color here. And as I keep going here, my skin color, right? That reds and saturations keeps changing because I'm, I'm essentially taking color within one spectrum and really just saturating that, that section of color. So I'll bring this back down, but I kind of don't look that good anymore. So I'm gonna add a little bit of a tan back to me here. Got a tan here. I don't, how does the other camera probably look? Got a little bit of tan here, right? I'm gonna go a little bit higher. Now vibrance, this takes those duller colors. So let's think about the colors behind me that haven't been amplified too much. And I could change that here, and it will affect me a little bit, but not as much as the back colors. So if you look at the background now, I'm introducing all this noise because the vibrance is trying to create color where essentially this would be dull. As I take it away, you see that that, that 
um, noise in the image that disappears, which is re look at the whites here. So if I go over and match that, you can see all this noise here. Right? That's again being part of that operator skill set. If I take it back down to zero, it goes away. Now, the other part, too, to think about with saturation is if I go the complete opposite direction, I lose all color. So now, like, I'm in a NOR film, and if I wanted to add or take away to this, I could take away the vibrance, which she doesn't affect too much. So when you do vibrance with no color, because there's nothing to represent there, it's not trying to highlight uh, the, the neutral colors, essentially, or the secondary colors. It doesn't work too well. So again, I'll go and reset that. Uh, and again, I've only ever used a setting really for cameras when I'm doing something like this. I'm not putting somewhere. Uh, then you have brightness and contrast, and a lot of people have a misconception of this so if i go on brightness here and I, I i raise this up you'll see the screen gets kind of washed out here uh, i'm adding more of white levels essentially and if i go to contrast i'm affecting the blacks so see my shirt now adding contrast it's affecting the black region here and as i add more it affects the effects versus if i take it away you can kind of back to that white zone here so those are really what those do and i have an image here which I won't show you because it makes sense, I think, what I talked about. If it doesn't make sense, I have a visual to show you guys a between hue, saturation, and light, light brightness. Um, but I feel like we did a pretty good presentation here. So if you if you need it, raise your hand, and I'll show you the, the other image of that. If not, we'll keep going forward. And I see no hands up, so we'll keep going forward. Color controls, audio outputs here. So again, this section here will supersede. Let me get my face out of here. Now you should double me. Um, uh, this has no audio. All right, so audio output here, this will over, over uh, or supersede the preset settings you've done in your preferences. This will override whatever those settings are. So I could have this at 100. I could have this at XYZ variable, um, essentially, though. But this allows me to override that functions. So project default means whatever I did a preference, or I can do a custom one and change this to whatever I want it to be outside of what it was set for preferencing. And then, again, I have those abilities for auto here. And, I, again, I didn't do this ahead of time, and I apologize. If I were able to add more channels, which it'll reboot the whole system. Uh, you would see more of those options here, and I can route those to different locations. And then finally, we have transition and fade out. So again, now I have the default one. We want I have the default one here. We're almost done here. I promise, Doug. Uh, I got a default one to dissolve. Again, I can override those sections here, and then I have um, fade duration here, which again I can I can change that on the fly here. And then that pretty much covers everything you need to know on the MIDI side. The last thing I want to show you guys here is back on the output side, when you go to system video outputs, this is a cool function. Let me see if I can open up. Uh, you guys can't see it yet. So let me see if I open up this one. Yeah, OK. So system video outputs, let me just share this with you guys real quick. All right. Last thing I'll show you guys real quick is system video outputs. So right now, we have a make of a two output. So think left and right. Or I could do a three, which would be three outputs. Uh, right now, I, I only have two things plugged in, but so there's two. I can do default resolutions here, uh, and I can go to the advanced section here and change these out individually, 1920 by 1080, or change these out to a two by two grid, which add four screens there. All right. Uh, one thing to, base, uh, to show here real quick is when you do a display test card, which we'll go into in a second on the other deck. When we do a display test card, this sends out a, an image that we'll go through over in just a second. I have display across outputs, which means it goes off both outputs, and I have edge blending ability here. Edge blending is a little bit tricky because this is based off of the total number. So 600 would be the total for both sides, 600 by 600 crossed over. I'll show you something for that in a second. And then I have the ability to pick which screen gets what. So right now, obviously, I just have my two plugged in here. Uh, and then down here, which is the most important part, is the warp perspective and warp linearity. So warp perspective, if I grab this four corners here, essentially, Keeps everything within that range. And if I disable edge blending, you can see that side there. Does everything within that range. And this is really good for on the fly kind of projection stuff. But if I went to warp linearity, sorry, warp linearity would be for screens that just need a simple corner warping, very quick and easy. Warp perspective, though, would change out my perspective. So that essentially, this image could go into a box. And that box would look properly to the visual eye outside of this situation. So very similar to what Reslin does, for example, or Media Mapper or Pixel Mapper or Module M, for example. That's where these come into play. Reset all corners, gets me back to zero, zero. Uh, and that's really the, the kind of the cool advanced functionality of this. When you're doing power down your power is between one and two. And you can, you can kind of vary that. And what that really is is the gamma curve, which is an X cross like this. That gamma curve is really just more about how much of that from zero to 600 pixels is going from 100% light all the way to zero light? Uh, what's that curvature going on? And that's really what you can do there. So if you're on a pinch and you have to do a 
mapping, for example, somewhere, and you had MIDI, you could do a two projector blend output, do a blend on it, and it pretty really good. I highly recommend that you do 600 pixel overlap. Uh, this 600 number here is based off a of pixel count. The power here, or the width here is based off a of pixel count. The power is based off of a gamma curve, uh, gamma curve essentially. So I'll go ahead and stop this one here. Uh, and then real quick, I know we're about to run out of time. I'm going to go over just one more thing with you guys on this deck here. Just to give you a representation, if you don't know what this is, I saw you guys did some projection stuff here. So if you get into that upper end of projection where you're doing more advanced stuff, like uh, warping or blending, I'm sorry, warping, blending, or curvatures, uh, something you want to think about real quick is, is pretty much what I'm going to show you in this PowerPoint. And let me make sure this, you guys can see that. Stand by. All right, so you guys can see that. So this is an example of an ultra-wide screen, 30, 40 by 1080. That 600 pixel overlap we talked about earlier, this is what it would look like. Uh, and that would be 30 pixels on one side, 10 pixels on the other side, which makes it in the total pixels, uh, which makes your new resolution 3550. So again, I'll go over that real quick visual there for you. And then keep going forward here. So this is what a normal output would look like if you had one of these. The, the key thing to think to hear is the circles. The, the reason projection is used circles and the reason this is such good for MIDI is that a circle is a circle is a circle. No matter what resolution you're doing, no matter what aspect you're doing, a circle will always look like a circle. It should never be an oval or any other shape. It should just be a circle. And to show you more of that, here's, a again, a widescreen with no information on it. And here is the blend zones going on. And what you'd want to have happen here is you'd want to match up those circles so that they're perfectly aligned and your blend zone would be uh, equal to that. Uh, and then... A representation of circle. So this is what I mean by circle to circle to circle. You can see these are four of the exact same images all lined up together, which make a perfect circle. If I had any kind of warping or geometry going on where it didn't line up, it would look like this. And if it's not a circle, it's not a circle. You can see at the bottom here, I've cropped a little bit. At the top here, my circles are fine, but they don't line up properly to the bottom circles because there's been some sizing going on and some differences. So MIDI's test pattern, I highly recommend you use it when you can because it will show these circles. These circles are very, very important. I'll go back real quick to this one. It shows you circles so that if you have to line up multiple projectors, you can line them up. This is a super big, important key uh, across the board. But um, anyways, I know I'm right about, I'm right about edge.